everyone, and welcome to Grace Family Church. Parents, if you have kids with you right now, you still have time to register them for Grace Kids. They will have way more fun spending the next hour with our awesome team. Don't forget Alpha Starts this week. It's not too late to invite that person you know has questions about God. Who will you bring to Alpha on Wednesday? If you want to gain a deeper understanding of addictions and how to help someone in recovery, then come along to our Recovery Facilitator Training in February. Did you know you can find quotes from sermons, catch up on services you've missed, or find out what's happening in the week, all on our social media? Here are all our details. We'd really like to meet you personally, so come and say hi to us in the front after the service. Our Engage process is all about connecting and finding your place at Grace. Oh 
Family Church turns 28. Take a look at the screens as we hear from our founding pastors, Mark and Christine. Cool. Have to do man again as well. Yeah, yeah. Can't you cut this glass? Just, hey. just do it. Hang away. Okay. Hi everyone. Mark and I are currently in Cape Town. We're here to celebrate the 30th birthday of our youngest daughter, Nicola. She's currently living and working in Berlin, Germany. So it's just great to have her out here. Tom and Jess are with us. Shani and her husband Will are hosting this birthday party. And so we're delighted and excited to be together as a family to celebrate. Yeah, not only are we celebrating Nikki's 30th birthday, but also on the 26th of January, 1992, Grace Family Church on Nikki's second birthday had its very, very first service. So as much as it's Nikki's birthday, Grace Family Church, happy birthday, you're 28 years old today. I want to thank everybody who's been a part of it for the past 28 years, and we're delighted that you are here to witness 28 years later the work of God through so many people's lives. Have a great service. God bless you. Isn't that awesome? Happy birthday, Grace. 28 years old. 
There are some of us who have been around that long and others who are not there yet. But happy birthday, Grace. Um, It's just such a a special space for us, obviously. Um, One of the things that I love about that story, and I love Mark and Christine sort of like, man, they're kids, aren't they? Like, they're just doing life. But but there's something powerful about this story in the context of the series, Dream Small. Because all they were told was, move to Durban, Grace Family Church. And we can often sit, as Tom sort of reflected on last week, we can often sit in this space and go, wow, look at, look at everything. But the, but the truths of the series are lived out beautifully in their reality. They dream small. And as we prepare to give now, one of the things uh, that I think it's important for us to know, whether you're giving here or give online, whatever that looks like for you, is part of what's got grace 28 years down the line and has the influence that it has has not been the gifts of a few, and you've heard us say this, it's important, but it's not the gifts of a few, but the sacrifice of many. In so many different ways and in so many different spaces, as you sacrifice week in and week out, maybe month in and month out, whether it's on a team or in moments like this, it's our collective sacrifice that means that we can celebrate today, 28 years of God doing incredible things in us and through us. And not just what he has done, but what he will continue to do. And that's why we give. And so let's just pray uh, as we prepare to do that. Father, (laughs) we are so grateful for everything that you've done. And I just want to just pray for Mark and Christine right now as they, with family, Father, would you bless them in the most beautiful and profound ways. For all that they have sacrificed in their lives, would you just restore to them in the most incredible way. But we thank you, God, that we get to participate. This isn't something that we just get to like, sit back and watch. No, you've invited us, all of us, to join you. And so as we do that now in one way by giving, we thank you for that privilege. Jesus, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, hospitality team. You can go ahead and pass the baskets. And uh, as they do that, I just want to tell you just about one uh, or two little things that are coming up. Uh, the first one, though is that around this time of the year, as we sort of celebrate the milestone of uh, when Grace started towards the end of this month, uh, we have traditionally, and we are doing it again this year, had a day of prayer and fasting. And so we are inviting every single one of you, whether you call Grace home or not, but uh, if you call Grace home or not, we'd love you to join us for a day of prayer and fasting. It's going to start tonight at 7.30, so after, at 6.30, sorry, after our evening service. And so we just want to encourage you to join us, have an early dinner if you get really hungry, um, but uh, to join us through prayer and fasting. Uh, then on Monday morning, uh, Tom is going to do some uh, guiding for us around what that looks like. And then on Monday evening at 6 o'clock, we'll meet back here to end the time of prayer and fasting together. Now to guide us through that time, like what are we praying into at certain moments and certain times, um, I want to encourage you to join the um, uh, Mklanga Campus WhatsApp group. The information's on your brochure uh, or the Mklanga Campus Facebook community group. And if both of those things scare you and you like, Facebook, what's that? because you're 18, Um, but if either of those two things scare you, um, please uh, just uh, join us as we pray, um, kind of in to out, right? So for our church, for our city, for our nation, for our world. And then when we gather together tomorrow night, we'll be praying for one another. So we really would love to have you along with us as uh, we pray and fast together. Uh, Then after the third service, um, we have a baby dedication. And this is just a a special moment for us as a church. We really believe that faith starts at home, and it's it's important to partner with parents. So this is a moment we get to gather with parents and friends and family, dedicate the little ones uh, to the Lord, and pray for the parents as they start this impossible, joyful, challenging thing called parenting. Amen, parents. I've just had a one-month-old sleep, I don't know. Okay, so that's, um, that's a little bit about that. But uh, if you are new to Grace, uh, maybe you're new to faith, uh, you've got some questions about this whole thing. How can I believe this? Is it real? Can I hold on to these things as true? Um, or maybe you're just asking the, the very profound and yet simple question, is there more to life than this? Alpha starts this week. Uh, it's Wednesday night here at the Mklanga, uh, Mklanga campus. I do want to encourage you to come along to that. Uh, but parents of teenagers, just a little... Uh, like note and teenagers, if you're in the room, it's also when we start youth back up here at the Mklanga campus and we're launching it with Youth Alpha. So if you are a teenager and you're exploring faith, come along to that. If you're a teenager wanting to find community, come along to that. Parents, bring your kids along, do Alpha, join us, first night, free food, what a win. Um, so, so come along to that. But to just give you a bit of context about, around what Alpha is um, and what the experience is going to be like, won't you check out the screens. 
Life is busy. Every day we ask questions like, what's happening today? What should I wear? How am I gonna fit everything in? But then there are bigger questions like, why am I here? What's my purpose? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? These are some of life's big questions, but there's rarely enough time to think them through. That's why Alpha exists. Alpha is a place to explore life's big questions in a safe and open environment. It's a series of sessions where anyone can share their thoughts and opinions and ask questions without feeling judged. When you come to an Alpha, you'll notice that first, there's food. Whether it's a full meal or a light snack, this is the time to get to know each other in a casual setting. Next, you'll watch an Alpha talk. The talks are created to engage and spark conversation. They explore big issues around faith from a Christian perspective. After the talk is a time for discussion. This is the most essential part of any Alpha. It allows everyone to share their own opinions on the ideas presented in the talks. It's a time for people with different thoughts, beliefs, and experiences to ask honest questions and have open conversation. Every week, there are guests coming for the first time to an Alpha in their community. Alpha is for everyone, regardless of background or beliefs. There's no pressure, no follow-up, and it's completely free to attend. Come and explore life's big questions. Find an Alpha near you today. So that is the Alpha course, and I really do want to encourage you, if that resonated with you, come along to Alpha. Uh, just a quick note, um, Ms. Carl Asia, I saw Sam walking in earlier. Carl, where are you? Carl, somewhere? I saw Sam. Um, they, there he is, Carl Ace. Can you quickly stand up for me, my bro? Just quickly stand up. Uh, yesterday, Carl led, no, st that's a weak effort at standing up there, Carlo. Uh, yesterday, Carl led a team of uh, church people from around, the, uh, around our city and from Grace Family Church as we launched uh, Alpha Prison Ministry at Westville Prison. I think we had about 180 uh, people doing Alpha there. Uh, 75 ladies, as I understand it, 55 uh, juveniles and uh, a group of rest. And there are cells in that space that are praying and fasting. And so it's just a beautiful thing. Carl, we love what you do, bro. Thank you so much for the way you lead us in that space. Um, yeah, I think we can probably clap again. That's, that's awesome. Um, if you are watching online, it's so good to have you with us from wherever you are in the world. My name is Paul, and I'm so glad that you've decided to join us today. Uh, we're wrapping up the series called Dream Small. And uh, I know that I think many of you, like me, have been encouraged and inspired over the last two weeks as we have been encouraged and inspired to dream small. And so if you've missed any of the, the last two sessions, they kind of do build on from one another. Um, but if you've missed any of the last two weeks, I'd encourage you to go online to our Grace website or to the YouTube channel and, and to, to click along and, and watch the last two weeks. Um, we really do believe that if we're going to step into the big futures that many of us want and desire... I think most of us have that, like somewhere in our hearts, even if we've been disillusioned by the reality of life, we want to step into something bigger and better in a new year. If we're going to do that, we need to dream small. We need to take the next right step. We need to listen to the whisper of God as He guides us through every moment of our day. We need to own our average. That like is news to you. Just go listen to last week and let Tom tell you your average. I'm not going to say it. He did it. It's about building our passions, and it's about planting flowers in 2020. I get a sense that if we're going to step into the big future we want, we need to do those small things along the way. And as I was reflecting on that and on this idea of, of how we do that and why we would want to step into a bigger future and, and what kind of gives us the energy and sustenance to do that, I was reminded of a verse in, in, in the Bible in the New Testament that speaks into this so, so powerfully, and it's Ephesians 2 verse 10, something that's always encouraged and inspired me, for we are God's masterpiece. Now, this is not in opposition to Tom's statement of being a magical unicorn. It's knowing deeply that you are created in the image of God. You are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. It's so important. Here's the thing, so we can do the good things he's planned for us long ago. You're God's masterpiece. You've got to know that this morning. He's got good things planned for you in your future to step into a big, a big and bright future. But, but as I was reflecting on that and as I was thinking about that for you and for, for me, part of the challenge of that verse is if I don't know who God is, 
or if I don't know that God is in fact good or good enough to have good things planned for me, why would I step into a good future that he's got? If I have a view of God that doesn't seem good or that I'm not quite certain of, it's going to be difficult for me to step into the future that he has planned for me. Our view of, our view of who God is and what we think God thinks of us will determine how we step into the big future he has planned for us. Our view of God and how we think God thinks of us will determine how we step into the future that he has planned for us. Richard Raw explores this idea a little bit further where he says, if we secretly, perhaps even unconsciously think that God is harsh and unreasonable, that God sets impossible standards and withholds any real expression of love because we can't attain those impossible standards, that God is unfairly keeping score on a scale that we can't even get up onto. It's going to paralyze us and it's going to cause resentment. I want to say this to you, that your view of God, my view of God, is possibly the most important thing that's going to define what your future looks like. Your view of God is going to define the vision that God has for your life. It's the most important thing that we need to get right together. The other reality of this is that, yes, my view of God and, and, and what I think God is like, his character, his nature is going to define the future that I believe he has for me, but, but in the same light... How I think God thinks of me is also important, because if I have a misinformed view of God's perception of me, I'm going to have a heightened view of others, other people's opinions of me. I'm going to be worried about what they say and what they think when I take a small next right step. I'm going to be scared to step into that future because, well, what happens if I disappoint them? You see, if I don't know, like to the very core of my being, that I am a masterpiece, not again a unique unicorn, but if I am a masterpiece created in the image of God, on purpose, for a purpose, I'm going to be moved into a space of fear and anxiety. Unless I know who God says I am, and I feel that to the very core of my being, not every day, man's life is tough, but if I know that I am a masterpiece created in the image of God, and I have this perception of of myself in light of who God is, then I can take a bold step forward. And I think think it's it's into this mindset and context that Jesus uh, shares the parable of the talents and or the parable of the three servants. And and we're going to spend a a bit of time today going through that. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to it. If you have a phone, you can um, click to it. If you don't, it's going to be up on the screens. But we're going to be reading from Matthew 25. But before we do that, I want to just sort of say this. This parable, like all parables, but this one in particular, it seems, has so many different ways of interpreting itself and, and, and for people over the years have, have, and how they've looked at it, sorry. And, and all those different interpretations have weight and value. There is meaning and, 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 and something for us in that. It's, it's the reason why Jesus told parables. He'd tell a parable because to one person it would challenge them on this level and to another person it would challenge them on that. And so as we go through this, I want to particularly explore two interpretations of that and and we'll go through it as we read the parable. So this is how it starts. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. Brave dude. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last. Before we carry on quickly, other translations have talents. That's where it's the parable of the talents. Uh, A talent was a a measure of value, a measure of weight. Um, Other parables that are similar to this uh, use a bag of gold. Jesus seems to have told the same story in different ways to land it in people's hearts differently. But irrespective of that, one talent or one bag of silver would be the equivalent to about 100 million rand in today's terms. So when he was given one bag, we often go, sure, poor dude, I want one talent. Let me just say that. I want one bag of silver, right? But here's an important line, dividing them in proportion to their abilities. See, what they were given wasn't the gift. The gift was what was inside. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. Cool little bank lesson here. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole, hid it under his mattress, put it in a non-investment savings account. I don't know what this guy did. And he hid it in the ground and he hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from the trip and he called uh, them together to give an account of how they used his money. 
The servant to whom was entrusted five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servants. You have been faithful in handling the small thing, the small amounts. So now I'm going to give you even more responsibility. Come, let's celebrate together. The servant who had received two bags of silver came to the master and said, Master, you you gave me two bags of silver to invest and I have earned two more. And so we kind of know where the master's going. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servants. You have been faithful in handling the small amounts. So now I will give even more responsibility. Come, let's celebrate. And before we sort of get on to the response to the third servant, those of you familiar with it know where it's going, but before we get to that, I want to just pause and, and sort of draw out some, some interpretation from what we've read already. There is no doubt that what this parable is speaking about, what this story is trying to illustrate to you and I, is the profound reality that every single one of us have been given a gift from God. Every single one of us have been given something to steward in our lives. God has given you gifts and talents and abilities, opportunities, resource and influence. God has gifted you something. And part of the truth of the stories and what we've been exploring through this series is the reality that when you are faithful with the small amounts, God will give you more responsibility. I love this, this language. You know, Tom, Tom used the, uh, the scripture from Luke 16.10. It says, if you're faithful in the little things, you will be faithful in the large ones which perhaps is probably less about if I do little, then I can get more rather than if I do well with little, God's gonna trust me with more. But irrespective of that reality, there is something about the fact that you and I have been gifted something from God that we need to own and take stewardship of. And that when we're faithful with the little, God will trust us with more. And I can think, honestly, I can think of no no more profound uh, story and an illustration of that truth than Grace Family Church. Uh, we, when, you know, we, we reflected on it earlier, but, but when Grace started, when Mark and Christine moved here, it was small. It wasn't like this. And it wasn't small for just one or two. It was small for a long time. In fact, hospitality team, if you're here, you're wearing the black shirts, can you stand up, please? I know like, I'm embarrassing you a little bit, but stand up, hospitality team. Can you guys stand? You're, you're being shy. Don't be shy. I can see the black T-shirts. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This was our church size, not in one service, but in all of them for a long time. That. Thank you, guys. You can sit down. In fact, one night, um, and and how awesome are our hospitality team? They're cool. I think they're cool. Um, But but one time they had a a church service, and they got prepared, an overhead projector. I'm not sure what that is. Mark said it in a story once, and so it's a thing. But like, they got it out, and apparently you turn it on, and there's light. That's cool. Um, But um, they got it out, and and they got ready for church, and, and no one came. No one. So they got pizza. I think we should get pizza one Sunday just to celebrate that reality, don't you? But, but here's the thing. They demonstrated, Mark and Christine demonstrated for us the powerful principles of the story. That when we can be faithful with what's right in front of us, irrespective of what that looks like or feels like, God will give us more responsibility. God's placed something in your hands this morning. God's placed something in your life. Will you be faithful with what he's given you? The little that he's given you. I've experienced this to be true in my own life. Some of you know I'm involved in a ministry called Red Frogs, and we, we go to partying environments and get to share the gospel and the love of Jesus with people. But it started on my matric holiday in a super clapped out old combi. And we gave some free lifts, and then we sort of thought, well, this seems to have like got traction. So the next year, we got an even worse combi and like three more mates. And that's what we started with. And And last year, we reached over half a million young South Africans at music festivals, universities, around the country. And and again, like, I think if you were to ask me, like, like, why on earth does this little red frog sweet have this thing? I don't think it's about that. I think there was a group of us who said, God, you've given us something in our hands. How can we steward this well? How, How can we just do well with what you've given us? And can I just say this? I know this to be true of your life and what God has given you. Because you are a masterpiece of God. Ephesians 2.10, you are God's masterpiece. You are his handiwork. God has placed in you this incredible sense of, of purpose, passion, and future. It's in you. And I know sometimes it doesn't feel like that. I know sometimes life feels like it's difficult and you get knocked down. But can I just say, this is why it's so important to have a right view of how you think God thinks of you. Because if you know you're a masterpiece and you take the next right step and then you get hit back, you can take the next right step. 
When you take the next right, right step and someone says, hey, that wasn't a good next right step, you can go, no, I know I'm a masterpiece, I can do it. It's so, so important for you and I to have a right view of who we are in God's eyes. And I really want to encourage you, I really do want to encourage you, if you don't yet know the reality that you are a masterpiece, discover it. Spend time with God, ask Him to speak truth into your life. But perhaps, perhaps it's about taking a next right step, right? This is what we believe here at Grace. Your design will reveal your destiny. I want to say that again. Your design will reveal your destiny. And so to to work that out, to figure out how our unique wiring and our unique call that God has placed on every single one of us, we're we're completely relaunching the the Engage process. If you've been around Grace for a while, you would know about Engage. We meet after the service up here in the front. But but we're relaunching that because we want to create a space where you can discover your design, you can hear the call of God into your life and step into the bright future He has for you. So, so if that is you and you're going, man, I want to step into this. I want to do some discovery. I want to encourage you. From next Sunday, put some time aside after church. Engage is going to happen every Sunday after every service every month. So if you miss a step along the way, no worries. There'll be another opportunity. But discover your design because I believe it's going to reveal your destiny. Now, before we, we read the response of the third servant, and we are going to get there in just a moment, again, some context is helpful. Because, because one of the ways we can interpret this parable is that it was a story Jesus was telling at the time to challenge the religious people and the religious leaders' mindset. A clue to this is, is in the first sentence of this parable of the story, where Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven, an important phrase, can be illustrated, an important phrase, by a story of a man, another important phrase, going on a long journey another important phrase. And if you're interested in in that kind of thing, I'd encourage you, do some research around that language. It really is quite encouraging. But this set of language and these various phrases and forms of the phrases are used by Jesus. They're recorded by the people who watched his life. And they often refer to the nation of Israel's view of who God was and what God was asking of them. When Jesus says the kingdom of heaven here, he's trying to challenge the people of the day, and I think us, around their perception of what it actually meant to to be a people of God. He's He's trying to bring another interpretation to you and I. When this parable speaks of bags of silver, of talent, and gold, it's a metaphor for the reality that every single one of us are given gifts of the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God? It's the, reality that we, it's the reality that God rules and reigns in our world and in my heart and life. And when I'm a part of the kingdom of God, when I know I've got that in me, man, I know the love of God. I know the grace of God. I know the peace of God in my life. God wanted the nation of Israel to understand that they had been given something of profound value. But he also wanted them to understand that it wasn't just about holding onto it. Yes, they were to receive blessing, but they were to receive blessing to pass blessing on to others. They, they were, their responsibility was to advance the kingdom of God into the world. And so through the response of the master to the third servant, we see Jesus challenging the people of the day, and I think us, challenging us around the idea of what have you been given of the kingdom of God, and what are you doing with it? So, so let's carry on reading. So the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, (laughs) important language here, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid that I'd lose your money, and so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant, if you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gather crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank at least? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. What we see in this parable is, yes, absolutely a call to be faithful with the little. It is absolutely a call to be faithful with what God's placed in your hand. But it is also a call and a deeper calling to every single one of us to know this, that you have a role to play in the kingdom of God. It's a deeper sense to know that every single one of us has a role to play when it comes to the kingdom of God. We're all invited to participate in sharing the good news, in sharing the love of Jesus, in sharing who God is and what God has meant to us, and not just simply sit and hold onto it. It's difficult, right? 
It's difficult to do that because oftentimes we, we want to be comfortable. We want to be safe. And so we, we know this. We sit you on a Sunday and we say, Jesus, we love you. But, but would we share it? Would we hear the invitation through this parable of Jesus to say, you have a role to play in being a part of bringing my healing and hope and restoration to the world? What Jesus was trying to do in this parable was challenge the mindset that said there were a group of people who were in and others who were out. And the people who were in kept the blessing to themselves. There is a call, there is a call to us to not just hold on and sit on to what we have, but to share it with those around us. I believe that part of what 2020 looks like for you is an invitation to play a role. I believe for every single one of you sitting here and for me, for us collectively as a church, there is an invitation to play a role in bringing about a meaningful contribution to our world and bringing about a meaningful sense of hope and, and God's love and peace into what's around us. I believe God is inviting you to have a vision for, for where you are, to see God's love and peace take over your homes, to take over your schools, your universities, your working environments, our city, our nation. Let us, let, us, let us participate with God in doing that. But here's the problem. So often I can feel paralyzed by the grandness of the vision. Sure, God, you're calling me to a lot. <laughs> and he is, he is to every single one of you. But don't be paralyzed. Dream small. Dream small. Take the next right step. Listen to the whisper of God when you're at work, at school, at play. Build on, 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 on who God's created you to be. Plant seeds that will reap flowers in 2020. You have a role to play. Super, super practically, maybe for you, maybe for you it's about inviting someone in your world to Alpha. You, you've got someone in your world, you know them, you, you, you love them, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's someone at work. They're asking difficult questions. They're, they're challenging the meaning of life. Why don't you just simply say, hey, why don't you come and sit with me at the first night of Alpha? Let's check it out. You get free dinner, they get free dinner, win all around dinner, right? But, 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 it's, but it's simple, isn't it? It's the next right step. It's dreaming small. God, I want you to change my whole office, but I'm going to start with just that person. Maybe it's about being intentional about building relationship with someone in your world that's different than you, that's outside of your normal connection. And that gets difficult, right? The older we get, and I know through experience, no, um, the older we get, man, it's easy to be comfortable, to have my safe space. And I think as Christians, we are notoriously bad at this. We've got our cliques, we've got our connections, we've got our groups, but the call of God is to go out. Would you step out? Would you build a relationship with someone? Would you show them the love and grace and care of God? Would you just hear their story, pray for them when they're going through a difficult space? Someone in, in your work environment that you don't really have a reason to do this for is sick. Take them a meal. Do the next right thing. Listen to the whisper. Take the step. For me, honestly, like for me, this gets super practical. And, and, I, and I felt God challenging me to, to be intentional about my sphere of influence and where I'm spending time. And so part of that for me, um, honestly, is I felt God asking me to pick two coffee shops that I would often go to. So I found the two best coffee shops that make, no, I'm joking, okay? Um, we all suffer for the gospel in different ways, right? And, and um, <laughs> I really felt like, no, honestly, like God was asking me, like, pick two coffee shops for this year and let those be the places you get coffee the most. And, and, and the reason for that is I want to be open and available to what God might do there through people I don't necessarily know. Getting to know the barista, getting to know his name, his family, his story, getting to know the owners and maybe just maybe sharing my story with them and inviting them to discover something of life and purpose. Coffee's my passion. Coffee's what I love far too much. It's, I've, I've got issues. Deb's our counseling. You know, I'm going to come, for you to, you know, come to you for counseling at some stage. But, but here's the thing. What are you passionate about? What do you get excited about in your world? What's the thing that you're interested in? Why don't you ask God what he wants to do with that? Because he's given it to you in your hand. He's saying, would you be faithful with the little? Would you have a role to play with where you are? It's not about these big things. Katie, I'm going to invite you to come up because I want to create a moment of response and, and reflection for you, for you and I. And, and as, I was, um, as I was thinking about the story and thinking about the parable and what it means to us, I absolutely believe that it, there is an invitation for you and for me to have a role and that God's inviting us to participate. But I am also interested and challenged by the response of the third servant. And I was wondering, why did the third servant respond in the way that he did? Why did he choose to hide and bury and not step into the invitation that was there for him? 
And I think, I think you can see it in his response to the master in verse 24. Verse, verse 24, he says this, Master, I knew you were a harsh man. I knew you were a harsh man. This third servant who hides the talent and holds back from using what he had been given demonstrates for us exactly what can happen and demonstrates to me exactly what can happen when I have a misinformed view of who God is. When I have a misinformed view of who God is, I'm going to hide and bury, bury what I've got. What you hear in the response is, you were harsh, I was afraid, and so I carefully did nothing. What you also see in the story is the first two servants, right? The first two ser- servants, they didn't have this fear. That they didn't imagine that they would be punished for failing. So they seized the opportunity, they took it with both hands, and they made something of what they'd been given. They lived freely and joyfully and enthusiastically because they knew that they were in a safe space. They could step out and be bold and be brave because they didn't have a crippling fear and expectation that they would be punished or maligned if they did something wrong. But the third servant had a different view of the master. The third servant held back for fear of punishment and rejection. He represents to us and to me the times that I have a view of God as demanding and punishing. What the third servant in his response to the master represents to you and to I is the sense that that we can have a view of God as a harsh disciplinarian, watching us to, to make a mistake when we slip up, he's going to punish us and catch us. This view, of God, this view of God can so quickly lead us to a place where we don't take risks because our fear is too high. We don't step into the future because we think that the rewards are too low. When we have a misinformed view of God as a disciplinarian, a harsh taskmaster, master, someone who's not interested or engaged in our life, it can so often lead to a space where we, ha- where we have small lives. Your view of God will define whether you have a big future or a small life. Would you rightly size who God is? Would you rightly size who God is? Because this is what you've got to know. Jesus came so that you may have life and life to the full. Jesus came so that you may have life and life to the full, to set you free from the fear that cripples us from stepping into our future. Jesus comes to set us free from the fear of being punished if we make a mistake or slip up in some way. Jesus has come to invite you and I to have a view of God as someone who says, come, let's celebrate. Come, let's celebrate. Would you, would you use what you've been given and then when you have, come, let's celebrate. There's freedom and there's, there's, there's abundance of life and expanding joy. I think what Jesus is wanting us to know through this parable is this simple and deeply profound truth that I know will shape your year. That God is good and you are loved. If you can know that and know nothing else, you will be able to step into the big future He has in store for you. God is good and you are loved. God is good. I know you've had a bad experience. I know you've been let down. I know you think He's not because of what's happened in your world. But God is good. And you're loved. You're a masterpiece. Created on purpose, for purpose. God has something grand in store for you. You're loved. You're loved. Your sins have been forgiven in the blink of an eye. In one moment, what Jesus did for you in one moment has set you free forever. So would you step into that freedom? Would you step into that life? Would you step into to that joy that God has for you? Would you step in with a sense of gusto and excitement? There's no risk of upsetting God. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do that would separate you from His love for you. Nothing. Nothing. Whether at the end of this year it looks exactly the same as it does now, nothing that will change God's feelings towards you. And may your every step of engagement with life, may your every step that you take, the next right step, may you know that as you do that, it brings joy to God. It brings joy to God. And then the truth of this parable is that as you take that next right step, God's gonna entrust you with more. As you, as you understand you have a role to play, God's gonna give you more responsibility in that, in that story. And there will be an expanding of life and love in your world. Life will have meaning as you step into what God has for us. But would you know, would you know that God is good and you are loved? John Piper reflects on kind of this reality where he says this, God is most glorified, lifted up, made famous, 
known. God is most glorified. God is most, most richly deserving of our praise. Whatever language you want to use in that, when we are most satisfied, content, happy to know that we're His masterpiece, happy to know that He's good, happy to know that we're loved, when we're satisfied in Him. As we finish up the series, as we finish up our time together, I want to pray for us and pray for you. Because my hope for you is that you would, you'd, you'd step into the bright future God has for you. He has good things planned for every single one of you. So would you dream small? Would you take the next right step knowing that God is good and you are loved? He's inviting you to play a role. And I think that as you do this, as you do this, you're gonna step into a bigger story. As you do this, you're gonna step into a bigger story that you desire. I want you to hear this, that God desires for you. So would you stand as we close our time together? I want to close by saying a prayer together and uh, we still have a few minutes left of the service and, and, and what I want to do is create a moment for you to own this idea of dreaming small and what that means for you and for your world. And, and so these words can be your own words and maybe if they are, you'd step into them. But, but here's what the prayer says. And I'm going to read it to you and then we're going to say it together in just a moment. God, in, 20, in 2020, I'm trusting you trusting you with my future with my plans with my business with my family whatever it is I'm trusting you that I'm your masterpiece and that you have good things planned for me and here's the truth no matter who you are what you've done that you would know if you would just accept this truth that you are made anew in Christ Jesus you're a new creation a masterpiece so if that is you if you're saying God I want to trust you in 2020 I want to dream small. I want to play a part. Maybe you would say these words with me. I'm going to pray them. If, you, if these are your words, maybe just in the quiet of your own heart, in your mind, you'd say them along with me. So let's pray together. If these are your words, make them yours. God, in 2020, I'm trusting you that I am your masterpiece and that you have good things planned for me that I am made anew in Jesus Christ. Jesus, I pray for every single one of us that we would know that we know that we know you love us and you are good. Help us, God, where we have a misinformed view of you to right-size that so that we would be able to step into the future that you're calling us to, God. Thank you, thank you that you've invited every single person here present to, to participate with you in bringing hope and healing and restoration to the world, God, but help us to dream small. Help us to dream small. Take the next right step, God. And so for all of us together, God, we, we trust you. We're gonna try. We thank you that even when we mess up, even when we fail, you love us. You love us. Jesus, we pray these things in your powerful name. Amen.